All right, so this study took place on the island of St. Croix. Uh, St. Croix is the southernmost of the U.S. Virgin Islands um, in the Lesser Antilles in the Caribbean. And more specifically, the study took place at the Nature Conservancy's USVI, or U.S. Virgin Islands Coral Hub. Uh, this hub has been around since 2009 doing branching coral restoration, but just in the past three to four years, we've really expanded our efforts to include multiple species, a land-based nursery, and uh, sexual propagation as a restoration technique. And one of our main goals at this hub is to contribute to two of these restoration priorities identified by the CRC Leadership Council uh, to scale up larva propagation and to increase restoration efficiency in terms of scale and cost effectiveness. And so what we've really been working on is calculating our cost per coral using different restoration methods and since cost per coral tends to go up over time as some mortality occurs, we've been really focused on our long-term cost effectiveness. Um, a number of conditions have been identified that can help increase the probability of recruit survival. And all of the conditions that I've listed here can be achieved by keeping your recruits in a nursery setting. Um, so, uh, since we know we can provide these advantages in this nursery setting, our question then becomes, do these initial advantages actually result in better long-term survival once the recruits are outplanted? And if so, is the increase in survival enough to outweigh the additional costs that are associated with this nursery rearing? To answer these questions, we designed a study where we used three different rearing techniques and we looked at uh, which resulted in the highest recruit survival, the largest recruit size, and the lowest cost per coral, uh, both one and two years after settlement. And so these methods were just direct outplanting onto the reef, uh, 15 months of rearing in a field-based nursery, and 15 months of rearing in a land-based nursery. We worked with Deploria labyrinthiformis for this study, and we collected our gamete bundles from 14 wild parent colonies. We mixed all 14 parent colonies together and we created an experimental culture at our land nursery and added 30 of the sea core gear or star substrates as our settlement substrates. And once settlement was observed, we scored and mapped juveniles on each substrate. Within a week of scoring, we transferred these substrates to the rearing treatments. Uh, so those assigned to the land-based nursery were placed in these outdoor raceways. The raceways were cleaned weekly and the substrates were hand cleaned monthly. Substrates assigned to our field-based nursery were placed on a PVC and plastic mesh table and both the table and substrates were cleaned monthly. And then substrates assigned to direct outplanting were planted onto the reef adjacent to our field nursery and received no additional rearing. All right, I got some music to go with me. Um, <laughs> so after 15 months, uh, we re-looked at all of our substrates, re-scored them, and measured the maximum diameter of any surviving recruits. And at this time, we planted any substrates from our land and field nurseries that had at least one surviving recruit onto the same initial outplant reef. Um, after nine months of the second, after this second outplant event, we rescored and remeasured our juveniles. To calculate costs, we followed methods outlined in the Reef Rehabilitation Manual. So this divides your costs into both work phases and cost categories. Uh, work phases are preparation, which includes things like substrate conditioning and site surveys. Gamete collection, hatchery phase, which includes the night of fertilization, as well as one month of early juvenile culture in the land nursery, either land or field-based rearing, outplanting, and annual monitoring. And our cost categories were equipment, consumables, labor, dive gear, tank fills, and boat use. Uh, so the first metric that we looked at was recruit survivorship. Uh, on the y-axis, we have proportion of recruits per surviving per each substrate. And the left plot shows survival 15 months post-settlement or after that initial rearing phase, while the plot on the left shows survival two years post-settlement or after that second outplanting phase. After the initial rearing phase, our substrates kept in the field nursery averaged 24% survival, and that was significantly higher than those that were directly outplanted, which averaged 9%. 
and those found in the, kept in the land-based nursery, which averaged 3% survival. After that second round of outplanting, substrates that had been kept in the field nursery averaged 12% survival, um, and that was still significantly higher than either of our other treatments, which averaged 3 and 1% survival, respectively. Um, success in sexual core restoration is sometimes measured by the number of outplanted substrates that harbor at least one surviving juvenile. So we chose to look at that as well. And again, I have 15 months post-settlement on the left and two years post-settlement on the right. So 15 months post-settlement, 100% of our directly outplanted substrates and our substrates kept in our field nursery had at least one surviving recruit, while about half of those that had been kept in the land nursery had a surviving recruit. After that two-year mark, the substrates that were directly outplanted dropped to only about half of them having a surviving recruit, while 100% of field nursery reared substrates still had at least one survivor. We also looked at recruit maximum diameter at each time point. After the initial rearing phase, our field nursery recruits averaged 10 millimeters in diameter, and that was significantly higher than those that were directly outplanted, which averaged five millimeters, and those in the land nursery, which averaged two. And after that second outplanting event, uh, our recruits that had been reared in the field nursery were still significantly larger than those directly outplanted. Uh, but what we found interesting here was that we saw no change in the average recruit size of those recruits reared in our field nursery between the time we outplanted them and nine months later while those recruits that we outplanted from the land nursery grew on average five millimeters in that nine month period. Uh, this is just to provide a visual of what we found. So these are both two year old D lab recruits. Uh, the one on the left was directly outplanted and the one on the right was reared in our field nursery. Uh, so this was pretty typical of what we found with our field nursery reared recruits being about twice as large as those directly outplanted. And in our cost per coral evaluation, evaluation, we looked at three different time points. So after this initial settlement, our cost per coral was only 16 cents. Um, after 15 months, our lowest cost per coral was using the field nursery rearing method at $1.35. So at that time point, the high survival of our land nursery reared recruits outweighed the additional costs. After two years, our uh, most cost-effective method was direct outplanting, but just narrowly beating out the field nursery rearing. So in summarizing results, um, I want to start by talking about the land nursery. We did have really low survival in that treatment. Um, however, this was really due to the fact that our land nursery had been built just two months prior to the start of this experiment. Um, so as you can imagine, there were still some kinks that needed to be worked out, some adjustments that needed to be made. And so we really just weren't able to provide those really ideal conditions that we had hoped to provide with this treatment. Uh, so we are not concluding that land nursery rearing is not a viable method or potentially cost-effective method, but it didn't work for us this time around. Uh, that said, recruits reared in our field nursery did experience the highest survival and the fastest growth of any of our treatments and was also the most cost-effective cost -effective option in year one. In year two, direct outplanting became our most cost-effective method, but since our field nursery reared recruits were so much larger than any of our other recruits, we still think that that option may become most effective long-term as those recruits have a higher probability of surviving in the long-term. We also think we can greatly reduce the costs that are associated with field nursery rearing, and I'm going to quickly talk about those ideas. So the first thing we decided to do was create a new field nursery structure that could house a lot more recruit substrates to minimize our costs associated with building and installing and cleaning uh, nursery structures. So this we're just calling a coral hotel. It's a very simple PVC structure. It has multiple staggered layers so that we can hold 1,000 substrates rather than just 100 on the table. And that wound up reducing our overall cost by 4%. Uh, which brought our cost per coral down 12 cents and made this uh, field nursery rearing once again the most cost effective method. And the second thing that we tried just this year was a seeding tent so we can directly seed swimming larvae right onto our field nursery table and cut out some 
steps in between. Uh, so this method reduced our total cost by 11%. And we were successful with it this year. We averaged six settlers per substrate using this method. So that's not quite what we'd like, but we did stock with uh, kind of a low density. So if we're able to increase our stocking density and get similar settlement rates and similar survival using this method in the future, it would reduce our two-year cost per coral by 33 cents a coral. Um, and when you multiply that by two or 3,000, that's quite a bit. Um, and so using that method, we can further increase the margin by which uh, field nursery rearing is most effective. So I'd just like to thank my co-authors. Unfortunately, they couldn't be here today. Um, also our funders and CCOR, they're always providing amazing advice and methodologies. Um, and I'd especially like to thank our staff and volunteers and interns who made all of this work possible. Thank you. Great, excellent. Okay, questions for Alex. Yes, in the front. Um, did you find any difference in mortality when you were changing to the hotel and the seeding plant between the different layers that I, I think I saw there? Uh, we don't know yet. We did start a study like that, but we haven't been able to go back and rescore them, so I'll let you know. <laughs>